Okay, so hello everyone. So uh, my name is Jun Yang, uh, professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. And today, so uh, we are happy to have uh, uh, Dr. Pan of Computer Science Department to give a technical talk. So uh, first I'd like to briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Pan Jiang. So, uh, He's now associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he received his bachelor degree uh, in control engineering from Tsinghua University. And then his master's degree uh, from Chinese Academy of Science. And his PhD in computer science from the University of North Carolina at the Chapel Hill. So his research interest, uh, robotic control, and learning with a special focus on the development of autonomous uh, robotic systems for navigation and uh, manipulation. So the title of his talk today uh, is about uh, autonomous excavation, uh, manipulation and uh, perception of uh, brand new materials. So it uh, looks very interesting. So let's welcome uh, Professor Panja. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thanks for the uh, like kind of present uh, introduction of Professor Yang. And uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how to use uh, uh, AI to control an excavator. Okay. In particular, how to manipulate and uh, perceive uh, the granular materials. So this is uh, uh, one image uh, showing one of my uh, former PhD students. Uh, she was uh, learning how to operate uh, an excavator. So I guess most people don't have uh, uh, similar experience before. So I want to, uh, to, to start from uh, the autonomous driving. Uh, I believe everyone should have uh, heard about that before. Okay. So autonomous driving is uh, uh, some technique which is uh, tightly connected with uh, the humans. Uh, so for example, uh, for a self driving car, uh, it is move it, is, it moves the human as cargo, and the self driving uh, truck it will share the traffic with humans. And uh, these uh, autonomous driving they are expected to be an important part of human society in the in the near future, uh, with a very large market size. Uh, for example, uh, nearly 80 billion uh, in 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, most importantly, uh, the society are very optimistic about the future. So for example, the uh, majority from China and the US, so they believe that uh, the safe driving car service will be available in, in 10 to 15 years. So how a uh, safe driving car works? Uh, it actually uses a general pipeline about of, of robotics. Okay, so you have some hardware like sensors which can collect data about the environment, and then the data uh, will go to some software pipeline, including the perception, planning, and control. So the software will analyze the data and then uh, make decisions. Uh, finally, the output is some low-level command uh, sent to the car, so then the car can drive by, by itself. Uh, so this is a very general pipeline. It works for a general robot. And uh, of course, uh, it will also work for a special machine like an excavator. So what is an autonomous excavator? So it is uh, simply a traditional excavator equipped with uh, uh, suitable sensors and AI algorithms. Okay. Um, so this actually is more promising for commercialization than autonomous excavator. The reason is that uh, we can easily uh, isolate the excavator from humans so that uh, we can avoid uh, all the troubles about the safety of humans in the in the close proximity of the machines. And the map size can be even larger than autonomous driving, uh, thanks to the uh, construction industry and also the, the mining industry. So here are some examples show uh, how the excavator is used in industry. Uh, it is uh, mainly used uh, for digging and uh, moving the soils. Uh, one special type of digging is called the trenching, uh, which uh, uh, ex excavate the deep, 
narrow and uh, a very long trenches for the placement of pipes or cables. Uh, of course, uh, the technique is, uh, is very general. Uh, it can be used uh, for any machine that wants to handle the soils, like uh, the bulldozer. Uh, okay, uh, so then why we need to develop the autonomous activator to replace the human operators? So the first reason is uh, uh, activation is very dangerous. Uh, it has a very high uh, fatality rate. So here I use uh, uh, some images to show uh, how an excavator may hurt the human workers. So here is another example. So this video show, uh, like uh, for example, because the excavator wants to change the physical world. So many of these changes can be risky. Uh, so in, this, in these situations, uh, we want to replace the human by, by robots. The second reason is uh, uh, autonomous activator can work happily in some extreme conditions that are difficult for humans, uh, like uh, uh, environments with severe vibration, uh, extreme weather, uh, severe dust, or uh, some conditions that can lead to uh, depression or fatigue. Uh, a third reason is, uh, is uh, okay, so human cannot uh, see through the soils, so they cannot find the objects buried in the soil. So as a result, uh, even the most skilled workers, they, they can make mistakes and damage uh, the underground infrastructure, uh, like uh, the pipes or cables uh, during excavation. Uh, compared to humans, uh, robots, they have uh, better sensors and uh, they can always uh, uh, very carefully follow the uh, very strict rules. So, so they can uh, safely avoid uh, these underground objects. And uh, uh, autonomous uh, excavator, they can also uh, improve the productivity. Okay, so here I just uh, use uh, the textile industry as an example. So eight years ago, uh, a worker can only manage a few textile machines. And uh, at present, a large factory with uh, a few thousands of machines only require tens of workers. So for, for construction industry and for excavator, uh, actually, we are in the same labor intensive stage of the textile industry 80 years ago. So one worker can only uh, operate a single machine. So if we have autonomous excavator, uh, a worker can manage tens of machines uh, simultaneously, and this can greatly improve the task efficiency. Okay, and uh, 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 autonomous excavator can also uh, improve the quality. So for example, if you compare uh, the human trenching and the robot trenching, so you can see that uh, the autonomous excavator can provide a much better result. Uh, and it can also reduce cost, like the human cost, uh, operating cost, uh, fuel consumption cost, and the most important, uh, the time and the management cost. Okay. So uh, as we just saw, uh, so there are many good reasons to have uh, autonomous excavators. Uh, but if we had that, uh, how can it change the, the future? So in 10 years, we expect uh, autonomous excavators to improve the automation level in construction and the mining industry. So as is shown by this video, okay, uh, so the, the autonomous excavator, they can team with the safe driving trucks and, uh, and work in the, in the construction site. So in 30 years, so when the AI technique uh, is uh, getting mature, uh, we hope that the autonomous excavator, they, they can understand uh, the construction design and the construction plan, and then eventually they can uh, uh, conduct the, the construction uh, pro project completely by itself, so as shown in this video. And the robot can, either work by itself or uh, it can work uh, with the uh, human workers together. So as you can see, when human is, uh, is, uh, is working, it can uh, guarantee the safetyness. And also that you can work alone when the human takes rest. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what we uh, think about the future. Okay, uh, however, to achieve uh, these long-term goals uh, uh, is not simple. Uh, because uh, activation actually is more difficult than driving. 
so even for humans, uh, excavation requires more training and uh, uh, more practice. Uh, autonomous uh, excavation has uh, more challenges than autonomous driving. So this is why. Uh, so this started uh, at almost the same time, uh, 40 years ago. But now, nowadays, uh, you can see that uh, autonomous driving is, uh, is more successful than the uh, autonomous excavator. So why? Uh, so there are many reasons. So the first reason is uh, uh, unlike driving, uh, the excavator is hydraulic actuated, so the control is more difficult. And uh, so it will have to uh, walk on some unpaved roads and then need to actively change the terrain. So both are more difficult. And then more importantly, uh, it also has one unique challenge. So how to handle the soil, which is a special material called the granular material. Okay. So as granular material, uh, soil is uh, complicated. Uh, it is neither solid nor liquid. So for example, uh, the sand is solid, but uh, if we add some vibration, it can behave as a liquid and it can generate uh, uh, some behavior like uh, buoyancy. And the uh, soil also has the complex behaviors like such as jamming, uh, latency, and the uh, flow application uh, when meeting an intruder. So these behaviors uh, will uh, cause difficulties when estimating the soil properties or when you want to uh, generate a simulation uh, for the soil. And then finally, uh, soil is not transparent. Uh, as a result, we cannot use uh, uh, popular uh, video sensors like cameras or, or lidars to perceive the buried object. Okay, uh, however, uh, we believe that for autonomous excavation, uh, it is uh, possible to bypass uh, all these uh, like soil complexities by designing clever algorithm. So after all, the human excavator operators, they don't have PhD degree on physics or civil engineering. Okay, so, but they still can handle the digging or changing tasks smoothly. So this is uh, the outline of the, uh, my talk today. Uh, we will introduce our work about uh, soil manipulation and the perception. Uh, the first part is about uh, how to uh, generate uh, optimal excavation trajectories. And the second part is about how to uh, detect uh, the obstacles buried in the soil. And uh, for both parts, we want to uh, bypass the soil physics uh, using some methods uh, whenever possible. Okay, so this is uh, uh, our goal. So the first is uh, the excavation uh, trajectory generation. Uh, we want to compute a sequence of excavator joints to achieve uh, the soil manipulation. Uh, the excavator is shown here. Uh, it includes uh, several parts, uh, several moving parts. So, so the arm will include the bucket, uh, the stick, and the boom. So the bucket is mainly for digging. Uh, the cabin and, uh, and the truck, so they are for navigation and it will change the location of the excavator. Uh, in total, uh, the excavator now will have uh, four joints. And uh, if, we, uh, if we move them appropriately, uh, we will result in the excavation trajectory. Okay, so this is uh, uh, about the excavation. Uh, before we describe uh, the our method for autonomous excavation, uh, we first list uh, uh, some, some goals, okay? So the most important goal, of course, is to uh, fill the bucket, okay? Uh, with uh, as much soil as possible. So as a result, uh, uh, on the left is a high quality excavation because uh, uh, as you can see, it's a bucket is, uh, is more than full. Uh, but on the right, it is uh, not so good uh, because the bucket is, uh, is not completely full. Uh, and uh, the second goal is uh, uh, excava uh, excavation algorithm should be general. Uh, it should adapt to uh, different terrains. So for example, terrain with different height and, and slope. And uh, it should also adapt to different uh, soil properties. Uh, so for example, uh, for dry clay, uh, the excavator should, deep, uh, should dig uh, deeper. But for wet loam, uh, they should dig uh, shallower because uh, uh, the loam uh, soil they have a larger density. And uh, we also uh, hope that uh, the excavation should uh, minimize the fuel consumption and also uh, minimize the execution time. Uh, it also should respect the torque limit to avoid uh, the overloading 
which will increase the wear of equipment. Uh, finally, the excavator uh, should try to avoid uh, hitting into any obstacles, either visible or buried. So this is, uh, uh, this, so these are our goals. So then uh, what our previous methods did, okay? So basically is that they were designed some fixed rules uh, obstructed from human operation, okay? So for example, if the terrain is flat, uh, they will decompose the excavation into uh, three steps. So first, uh, the bucket will uh, penetrate into soil, and then it will do uh, some uh, horizontal drag to accumulate the, the soil. And finally, they will rotate the bucket to, to finish the collection of soil. Uh, but if you need to dig from like another terrain, like with some slope, uh, you have to use the, uh, another set of rules uh, requiring the synergic movement of, of uh, different parts of the excavator, like boom, stick, and, uh, and the bucket. So the problem of, uh, of these uh, uh, human designed rule is uh, they have limited the flexibility. So it is uh, very difficult to adapt to different terrains. And uh, if you have obstacles, uh, they will also be very difficult. And um, a little room is left uh, for trajectory optimization. So for example, we can only generate the, these kind of uh, uh, zigzag uh, paths. So we cannot uh, generate uh, some smoother passes, uh, for example, adapted to different uh, uh, soil properties. Okay, so to overcome uh, these limitations, uh, we notice that uh, the key components in the aspiration actually are the penetration and the separation. So penetrates means to, uh, is responsible for the failure of soil, and the separate uh, is responsible for the accumulation of soil. And uh, if we appropriately uh, combine them together, uh, we can achieve the aspiration. So based on that, uh, we relax the original uh, three step, the penetrate, drag, and curve, and rotate to something, to the penetrate, separate, and lift. So in other words, the horizontal drag is not necessary and is too restricted. And uh, we replace that by the more general separation. And the more importantly, uh, we found that we actually we don't need to manually design uh, these uh, three steps. Uh, instead, these three steps can, can uh, naturally emerge uh, from the data, okay? So, uh, which are represented uh, in a structure called the uh, reachability map. So here are some details. Uh, it is uh, very simple. So, so given an excavator, so this is, uh, uh, so for each arm, uh, for the arm, you have the, something called the excavation plane, okay? And uh, for each position in the plane, uh, it can be reached uh, by the bucket tip from uh, uh, some special uh, heading angles. And, uh, and it can only be reached uh, in a subset of, the, of this region, okay? And then we can compute the, uh, uh, the set of reachable head angles for each position uh, in the excavation plane. Uh, and then the result is uh, uh, the, the, the reachable map, okay? So in this map, so the, the robot uh, or the excavator actually stand at the zero, zero. And the empty location means that it is uh, not reachable by the bucket tip, okay? And so this is the meaning of uh, this, uh, this map. So if we look at this map carefully, we can see that uh, the reachable heading angles will rotate uh, in a clockwise manner. So this is uh, uh, very important. And because that, uh, we can roughly uh, classify or categorize the different positions into three classes of penetrate, separate, and lift, okay? So notice that, so this classification is no longer rigid, okay? So it is from, from data rather than from the, the man-made rules uh, as, as data in the, in the previous solutions. And we can actually uh, read many more important messages from this uh, uh, reachability map. Uh, and so, so for example, uh, starting from a position in the map, we can know for how long and with which orientations uh, the bucket uh, could translate uh, along a certain uh, direction. So here is uh, one example. So if the bucket starts at uh, that position and uh, moves to the left, uh, it can move uh, one step, uh, two step, but not uh, uh, three steps because otherwise uh, the heading angle is uh, no longer reachable, okay? 
Uh, so the bucket can at most uh, translate three steps. And uh, uh, actually for any point in the, in the map, we can do this. And then we can understand uh, so how fast we can move along different directions. Okay, so this is uh, another important message. Uh, and uh, the map also allows us to roughly estimate uh, how much of bucket is filled by checking the volume, which is uh, below this path. And uh, if there are uh, obstacles in the scene, we can just uh, mark uh, the corresponding positions in the map as invalid, and then the remaining computation is the same. Okay, so this is uh, how can we use the rich average map. And then now uh, we are ready to search for an excavation trajectory. So here we use uh, uh, this cartoon to show the basic idea. So first the excavator, uh, it will use uh, uh, sensors like LIDAR uh, to get the geometry of the terrain surface. And then it will choose uh, uh, one point. So for example, the red point there to penetrate uh, the, the terrain. And uh, the bucket's penetration direction uh, must be uh, roughly opposite to the terrain normal because otherwise you cannot uh, dig in, okay? So in this way, you can narrow down uh, your choices. And then for each possible uh, penetration direction, uh, we can read uh, it's uh, uh, allowed uh, like uh, heading angles from the reachability map. And since the bucket must rotate uh, clockwise uh, to collect the soil. So some directions are not appropriate and then we, then we can delete them, okay? Okay, uh, next. Uh, for each uh, each direction, uh, we can use uh, like we, because we know the the bucket's uh, current uh, head angles, so we can further narrow down uh, its uh, allowed uh, head angles. So finally, we can compute uh, the maximum separation movement from uh, different different uh, depths, uh, different positions, and along different uh, different directions. So here we have the three choices, okay, and for each choice, uh, we can. Uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, compute the sweat volume of the soil and uh, then choose the, the one that can satisfy the, the bucket filling requirement. Because this is how you can know, okay, so the bucket is filled. So finally, we can find a sort of like lift uh, uh, positions and, uh, and connect them to the separation trajectory using the rotation. And the result is uh, an activation solution. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the basic idea. So by using this very simple uh, method, so so actually we can, uh, for example, achieve the, the trenching. Okay, so here is uh, uh, one simulation result uh, by 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 use this cartoon algorithm. Okay, so you can see. Uh, so and then if you check each of the buckets, so they are they are full. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the first part. And uh, so after this very, very simple method, you can see that we, we can achieve two goals. So we can handle the different terrains and also we can uh, avoid obstacles. But for all the other goals, um, so we cannot uh, uh, satisfy them exactly. However, uh, here we can use some heuristics, okay? Because uh, the excavator uh, solution is general general generalizes uh, from the humans uh, like penetrate drag and rotate the policy. So because human works well, so then we believe that uh, uh, this very simple method also works well in practice. But uh, because uh, we are studying robotics, so we want to optimize the solution. But the heck, how can we do that? So our solution is that okay, we want to uh, first uh, we want to completely uh, discard. Uh, the three-step formulation, okay? So then instead, uh, we want to define the excavation process as a set of uh, necessary conditions, and then we can formulate the, uh, the, uh, the, the optimization. And uh, after you solve the constraint optimization, then the uh, excavation trajectory will emerge naturally, okay? And, um, okay, and, uh, and also in this way, we can also handle all the goals, all the other goals explicitly, and can also carefully handle the, the most important uh, soil related goals. Okay. Uh, so this optimization is very complicated. So uh, we need to use uh, uh, the uh, reachability, reachability map results as the initial solution. Okay. 
Okay, so here is the, 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 the idea. So our idea is that we want to formulate everything in the excavation as constraints on the objectives, uh, including time, uh, excavation process, uh, soil properties, uh, torque limit, and uh, terrain shape. And uh, so then we go through a black box of constraint optimization, and the output is, uh, is the excavation solution. Okay, so this is uh, the basic idea. So let's discuss two of the most uh, challenging parts. The first is that uh, how can we use a set of uh, intuitive uh, necessary conditions as the domain knowledge to define the excavation process? Is that, that possible? So here we use uh, this cartoon to explain the basic idea. Okay. So, so here the gray part is the terrain. And uh, by using sensors, we can, for example, get the, the surface of the terrain. Okay. So how can we do that? So first, uh, the necessary condition is uh, uh, the trajectory of the bucket uh, must be under the terrain uh, surface. So this is uh, very reasonable. And also it will uh, be uh, roughly a concave shape. So how can we do that? So the first thing is, uh, uh, so the, the bucket should go inside the, 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 uh, the terrain and go outside. So on both ends, uh, the tip should touch the terrain. And uh, when you go into the terrain, uh, the direction should be uh, inward. And then when you, you, you go out, of course, the direction should be outward. And uh, finally, uh, the direction should always uh, rotate uh, monotonously. Okay, so this is uh, the four things. The second uh, uh, intuition is uh, uh, that the, the path should always uh, below the, the terrain so that the, the, uh, we can always have the soil failure. Okay, so how can we do that? Okay, so basically, how can we make sure that uh, this shape is always uh, below uh, the terrain surface? So we only require uh, the bucket tip, its move, moving direction is always to the left side of the heading direction. Okay, so if, if you can do that, then we can achieve that. Uh, the third uh, condition is uh, uh, we want the bucket to break in the soil, and this is also simple. So when, you, when the heading direction uh, should be uh, inward, Okay, so that you can go inside the terrain. And when the, when the bucket uh, leaves the terrain, we want to make sure that the soil is not spilled out. And uh, so this is also simple. We want to make sure that uh, the heading direction is always upward so that the gravity will make sure that uh, the, the soil will not uh, fall out. And then finally, is we want to avoid the bucket to back press the soil. And uh, this can achieve that by uh, rotate the the h uh, the heading direction in a in a clockwise manner. Okay, so if you can if you uh, if you do this, so you can translate all these conditions into constraints, and then after you solve the optimization, uh, you will have a valid uh, excavation trajectory. So this is uh, uh, the secret. <laughs> uh, so next is uh, the most uh, interesting part. So how can we add the domain knowledge about soils into the optimization? Okay. So here we use a trick. Uh, we found that uh, we can use a number called the bucket filling factor. Okay, so this number can regulate the relation between many different uh, uh, excavation factors and the amount of soil to be excavated. Okay, so if we can understand uh, this relationship, so then we can build a, a bucket soil interaction model that can bypass the, the soil, uh, soil physics. So, so what is uh, the bucket filling factor? So it is very simple. It is just the ratio of the excavation sweat, uh, excavation sweat volume and the bucket volume, okay? So a large KBF values means that we really want to, to fill the bucket and, and vice versa, okay? So we want to, to manipulate the, uh, this, this value. Okay, so to understand, uh, to, to build uh, some uh, like a quantitative model, uh, we did some experiment. Okay, so for example, this video shows that uh, when the KBF value is large, uh, the bacteria is full. So otherwise, the bacteria is uh, not full. Okay, so of course, we want to fix all the other factors. Okay. Uh, and uh, the second experiment is uh, uh, if uh, KBF and the other factors are fixed and, uh, and uh, more soil, they will be collected on the wet terrain uh, due to the increased uh, compactness and, uh, and a strong adhesion, okay? So, so this is uh, another relationship. And the third relationship is uh, 
uh, if we fix the KBF and the many other factors, so if we move the bucket faster, so we can collect more soil uh, because uh, the fuel soil can escape from the bucket if the velocity is large. And this is uh, the final experiment. Okay, so basically, the, okay, and the more soil can be collected uh, on the slope tree. Uh, the reason is uh, very simple. Uh, so the slope can block the, the front soil so that it cannot be pushed away. Okay, so this is uh, the final one. And based on these uh, three experiments, we can build uh, this uh, uh, back soil uh, interaction model. Okay, so how, uh, so if, for example, if we want to achieve some specific amount of excavated soil, how can I change that? Like uh, given different uh, factors, so how can we change the KBF? Okay, so for example, now, so if I, I change the soil to from the wet one to the dry one, so then I want to increase the KBF. And uh, if I want to uh, like uh, move the bucket faster, uh, I want to decrease the velocity of the bucket and also need to increase the KBF. And uh, if I uh, change it from the slope terrain to the flat terrain, also I want to increase the KBF, okay? So this is, uh, uh, so we can understand the, uh, the relationship between them. Okay. Uh, finally, is about the torque, uh, the torque limit constraints, so i.e. about the forces, okay? Uh, our solution is that we can approximately uh, compute the normal and the friction forces uh, happen during the activation by using uh, uh, some model uh, related with the fluid dynamics, okay? And uh, once we can do that, uh, so we can restrict uh, the torque to always uh, be smaller, some by uh, smaller than some some threshold. Okay, okay. So after you 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 combine everything together and uh, solve the approximation, eventually we can get some uh, very good results. Okay, so you can see that. Uh, so after approximation, uh, the excavation trajectory can be much shorter, and uh, the time cost is also much short, uh, much smaller. And also it can adapt to different soil properties. So for example, if the soil is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has a higher density, you can see that uh, it will dig a, a shallower to avoid a, a very large uh, resist resistance force. Okay, and uh, so then, uh, so before we deploy our method on some uh, physical uh, excavator, we did some lab uh, experiments to verify uh, so our method can adapt to different terrains and also is efficient. So here we are using some LIDAR to monitor the terrain surface and to monitor how it changes after each digging. And the task is uh, uh, accomplished when the terrain surface is lower than some uh, target height. Okay, so assumed uh, by, the, by the star here. So and our method needs to uh, finish the task in five excavations, okay? And uh, you can see from the video, okay, almost uh, most of the uh, excavation is, is full, the bucket is full. So, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is the first digging. And uh, okay, and uh, so, so uh, that one is, uh, uh, top one is uh, the terrain before the digging and uh, another one is uh, uh, the terrain after the digging. Okay, and uh, you can still see, see the difference. So this is the second digging. This is the third one. And uh, this is the fourth one, okay? And uh, finally is uh, the fifth one, okay? So, so then you, you can finish the task because it's already like uh, reached that position uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom. Okay, and uh, so after we are confident about the, uh, the performance. So we uh, try that on the uh, physical excavator. So this is some, some, some real world experiments. So you can see that, okay, so there is uh, uh, one uh, excavator, they want to do the digging and they move the, uh, the, the, the soil to some truck, okay? And uh, the second experiment is about trenching. Uh, so you can see, so this is uh, the task. You want to uh, trench like okay, and uh, eventually they can finish the task. Okay, okay. Uh, 
So everything is good, but then there's one problem. So if there were some obstacles uh, buried on the soil, uh, so we also want to avoid them. So an old method can, can actually do that. So for example, in the beginning, uh, the expert does not know the existence of the obstacle, and then it can compute now uh, one excavation plan. And then when it uh, executes uh, this, uh, this plan, uh, the bucket will hit the obstacle, and then uh, it will feel a very large uh, resist resistance force. Okay? And uh, after that, uh, the excavator will update the position of the obstacle in the, in the map. And then based on that, you can do the replan and then get a new result. So here is uh, uh, a comparison between the original and the adjusted path. So you can see that it can avoid uh, uh, some obstacle. Uh, however, uh, when the bucket uh, actually hits the, the obstacle, sometimes it is uh, too late. Uh, especially when the buried objects are pipes or cables, okay? So this is why uh, the government, uh, actually they are uh, very strict you know, and uh, conservative about you know, uh, excavating around the regions with uh, buried uh, infrastructure, such as, uh, so for example here, you can see that uh, they have very detailed uh, investigation uh, before the excavation, and uh, they require you to use uh, the hand digging uh, whenever possible. So, so some human, some human operator can indeed uh, work very well, uh, but this heavily requires uh, relies on the uh, the worker's experience and the skill. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, the skilled human workers they can feel the vibration when the bucket uh, starts to touch uh, the barrier of obstacle, and then they can stop in time. And uh, also, we have some sensors uh, that can help the workers. So, for example, uh, based on the acoustics. Uh, based on the uh, ground penetrating radar, uh, some ultra wide band sensor, and, uh, and the various sensors. Uh, but these sensors, they can only provide a, a very rough uh, point signal about the existence of the buried objects, but they can not actually locate that, okay? So what we want actually is uh, some proximity sensor that can feel the buried objects before touching it. So in this way, we can avoid uh, the damage uh, when touching the, the object. So the sensor is not is useful not only for uh, for excavation; it can be also be useful for like applications like uh, archaeology and uh, mine sweeping. So where even a very gentle touch is uh, is, dang is is dangerous. Okay. So our principle is based on uh, uh, the jamming property of the granular material. Uh, the jamming means that uh, the granular material, like soil, they can transit uh, between fluid and the solid when its density changes. So, for example, in this video, uh, the jamming happens in the place where the intruder actually touched the, the moving, moving soil. So here we use a rod to indicate the bucket. So when the bucket uh, normally moves in the soil on the, on the left, so there is no or little jamming. So when the, the bucket uh, approaches the buried object, then we can have a significant jamming behavior. And finally, uh, when the bucket, uh, uh, eventually the bucket will, of course, hit the obstacle. So we want to develop some sensor that, that can distinguish the jamming state in a sensitive manner so that we can, we can detect this obstacle. So here is our solution. We use the, the tactile sensor uh, mounted on one end of the uh, some probe to perceive the force change when jamming happens and then use the signal uh, to detect the, the buried object. Okay, so, but there is one challenge. Uh, so if we simply move the, the probe in the soil, uh, the soil will, will accumulate or pile up uh, before the probe and uh, you will have a large noise. So to, uh, to avoid this, we actually want to leverage uh, one property of the granular material. So if you add some, some AC vibration uh, to the granular material, you actually can control the fluidization of the granular media, okay? So here we let the probe to move in a spiral way so that we can generate a, a suitable uh, AC vibration. So then uh, the sewer will behave like a liquid and uh, will not accumulate the, before the probe. Okay, and this is uh, uh, the force we measured. 
by using our sensors. So we can notice that uh, there is a very stable uh, periodic signal before the jamming happens. Okay, and then there is some abrupt change in the force magnitude when uh, the jamming actually happens. And then this change can be used uh, to detect uh, the buried object, which is, uh, which is uh, behind uh, uh, the detected position. Okay, so the blue one is uh, where the object, uh, object uh, like uh, locates. Uh, of course, the signal is noisier. So we use some uh, machine learning algorithms to detect uh, the change uh, so that we can detect uh, the, the objects in the, uh, about in the two to three centimeters before the, the buried up location, okay? Uh, and then we can use this sensor to do many things, uh, to, do, to do many different things. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, we can use that to, to localize uh, the buried objects in the soil, okay? So the, uh, the probe, uh, first move in the soil to collect data. And, uh, and then uh, in the entire procedure, uh, the probe will not uh, touch the, the obstacle, okay? So this is uh, the data collection part. And uh, after that, uh, we can learn from the collect data in some online manner, and then we can re recover the location and the shape of the buried objects by using some uh, machine learning technique. And then this is uh, our final result. So then you can see uh, the location of these uh, two obstacles. They are roughly uh, correct. Okay, so, so, so we know that okay, there are some obstacles there, so we need to avoid them. Okay, so these are the two parts uh, that I want to uh, like introduce today. And the takeaway message is that uh, the soil uh, as a granular material, it has, uh, it has many interesting uh, physical properties. So it is, uh, uh, helpful to use these uh, physical uh, domain knowledge, but uh, too much physics can be computational intractable. So for example, uh, for excavation, so if you don't use any physics, uh, you just use the three stage uh, rules. And, but if you use too much, you want to use the soil simulation, this is difficult. So we want to use uh, the physics in a no more and a no less way. Like for example, we can use the reachability map and also use uh, the interaction model between the soil and the bucket to avoid uh, uh, too much trouble. Uh, for perception, the same. So if you don't use any physics, you just use uh, human feeling, then the performance is bad. Uh, of course, you can use uh, some more advanced sensors, uh, but the, sen uh, the, the system is more complicated. And uh, in our case, we want to use uh, the, the granular jamming to avoid uh, all these troubles, okay? Um, for future, we want to combine the physics and the computation uh, in a more efficient way so that we can achieve uh, efficient and the dexterous manipulation and the perception of the, of the granular materials. And there are many uh, open problems left. So for example, how to achieve uh, the soil throwing uh, like a humans. So this is more efficient. And how to use the, uh, the excavator as a general uh, robotic arm to, to handle many different tasks. And uh, so this is uh, uh, some work uh, up in the collaboration with uh, Baidu Research and also uh, with uh, uh, some of my former and uh, current PhD students. And uh, we are also collaborating, uh, for example, with uh, Peter Cobb uh, on the archaeology and also uh, uh, with other people on the civil engineering. Okay, so this is uh, about uh, my, my talk and uh, I would love to take questions. <laughs>